welcome to the uh, BEF Digital uh, uh, series of seminars. And this one's titled A New Horizon for Property. And it's hosted by Crow, uh, of course, the BPF, and Women in Property. Uh, so we're delighted that you've been able to join us. Um, we structured this seminar as three five minute talks. Um, and please do ask questions through the question and answer box. Melanie Leach um, uh, from the BPF, the Chief Exec of the BPF, of course, will be uh, 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 facilitating and we'll have about 40 minutes of questions after our three five minutes of slots, um, speaker slots. So I'm Stacey Eden, I'm Head of Property Construction at Crow. Um, we've also got on the line two of our real estate partners to answer any tax questions, um, Caroline Fleet and Paul Fay. I will spend, be spending a few minutes uh, introducing everybody and of course uh, discussing some of the high level tax issues. Our second speaker is Melanie Leach, the Chief Executive of the BPF, and she will be discussing uh, the property industry from a government perspective, particularly focusing on housing and planning and what the new normal will look like. Um, and our third speaker is Sandy Reese jones from Women in Property, and that she will be speaking about diversity for a few minutes. Um, it's a shame, of course, that we can't do this face-to-face. -face. We look forward to maybe next year doing it face-to-face -face, um, and hopefully see everybody soon. Um, for those that don't know, uh, and a whistle-stop stall, because I'm running into my five minutes, is Crow is a top 10 accountancy firm. Uh, we handle a number of service lines around real estate clients, including accountancy, audit, taking firms to market, and probably the key tax, a lot of VAT, a lot of SDLT, a lot of tax structuring and tax advice. Our clients range from small private companies, large private companies, listed groups, international groups, and we're heavily focused in the sector. Obviously, we're members of the BPF, putting on webinars such as this, and uh, I co-chair, for instance, the Variety of Props, uh, lunch committee, we write a number of articles in the press. Um, but I think that's enough of, 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 a, of a background. So when we're talking about tax, we've got to look at it in terms of the wider context. Um, the wider context, of course, is that um, there are planning reforms at the moment uh, 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 taking place, we're delighted to see. And we're also in terms of the non-payment of rent uh, by tenants. So I'm looking forward to hearing what Melanie has to say about about these issues. So tax is certainly down the agenda, particularly in a situation we're in now, where cash is king. Our clients and we're assisting and negotiating with banks, uh, discussing them, refinancing new loans. So it's very, very difficult to mention tax at the top of the agenda. Um, if we do start to look at the whole fiscal policy of the government, the government is gonna to have to close the gap between expenditure and taxation. COVID-19 crisis seems to have so far cost about 300 billion pounds and how are we going to close that? Um, particularly given that the property industry is one of them uh, in the UK, we have a very high tax take from the property industry, one of the highest in the OECD world. So that's a little bit about the context. So there are only two, three areas I've got time to mention regarding tax. The first is SDLT. Um, clearly from our surveys, SDLT is seen as the biggest tax barrier to growth. It damages liquidity, it damages housing supply, uh, and actually a high level of SDLT result in the government taking less money. So um, uh, 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 we're delighted that even though there are 11 rates of SDLT, or at least 11 rates of SDLT, there's a zero rate on residential up to half a million. But this won't help fully. Um, we'd like this to go further the high rates of SDLT at the half a million pound plus or a million pound plus housing act as a funnel. So again, we still have this problem of liquidity and damage to the housing supply. Notwithstanding that the, the, the issue of course is, is, is still lack of stock um, and planning reforms and supporting house builders are also extremely important. Uh, but I thought I'd mentioned the SDLT point. The second point to mention, and again, it's probably another big tax barrier to growth. Our survey certainly suggests so is the complexity of the tax system. Not only is the property industry in the UK highly taxed, um, the system is highly complex. There's been numerous changes over the years, um, and therefore uh, uh, we'd like that, that, that if there are gonna be changes, they also simplify the system, as well as reduce the type of tax rates. Um, and as I mentioned with SDLT, 
This may lead to an increase in tax take for the government by reducing the tax rates. Um, and the last point just to mention, which it, it, it is of course can never be forgotten, particularly at this time, is taking a, a advantage of, of deferral mechanisms, particularly around VAT and payaway. And we've of course been assisting our clients and contacts and friends doing that. So uh, I think that's enough for me. Hopefully I've welcomed everybody and briefly touched on a few tax thoughts. And I'm gonna hand over now to Melanie Leach. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stacey, and good morning, everybody. Um, I'm going to uh, take the first 10 seconds or so of my five minutes by reminding you, uh, as Stacey said, that we want the majority of this uh, webinar to be a, an interactive session uh, in the new way that we're all having to learn to interact with each other. So please do use the Q&A uh, function uh, to send questions to the panel. Um, and I will uh, manage to get uh, and get through as many of those as I can in the time we have after Sandy and I have spoken. Um, but as Stacey said, I just want to spend uh, a few minutes just talking a little bit about some of the sort of key policy and market issues um, that we've been seeing over the last few months and speculate perhaps a little bit about uh, what might be to come. Um, Stacey uh, touched on housing already. Um, clearly, we are seeing some early signs of uh, recovery in the housing market. Um, and the um, fact that we have such a supply and demand imbalance in the UK does mean that we are optimistic about um, the prospects for recovery for uh, housing. We, um, those of you who um, know the BPF will know that we take a particular interest in build to rent um, because we tend to represent the institutional investors that uh, are very active in that sector. And we do see that the build to rent sector may be able to be a key part of um, an early uh, recovery uh, for the UK economy, as well as meeting that huge, huge need and demand for housing. Um, we see coming a big push uh, on social housing. We've been part of, uh, are part of a couple of campaigns to try to really use the opportunity of government, a significant investment that government makes in housing and in the housing market to really drive um, the delivery of social housing uh, and also uh, there are particular campaigns running to try to make sure that within that we recognise um, homes for heroes and homes for the key workers that have supported us all um, so effectively and so admirably through coronavirus. Um, I think there may be a change uh, in what people are looking for when they are looking for a home. Um, I was on the webinar earlier this week with uh, some planners who are very involved in the housing market um, already starting to think about redesigning homes to uh, incorporate more uh, flexibility so that people can uh, more easily work from home. Um, we think the new normal will encompass more working from home and that you know, people want to be looking for the facilities and the ability to do that uh, in their homes. And also outside space, I think, has become uh, more clearly important to people when they're thinking about uh, their home environment. So it may be that as we move forward we start to see different kinds of homes and potentially people looking in different places to new property hotspots emerging. Um, if people think about not having to commute to an office uh, at least certainly five days a week uh, in the future. So it'll be very interesting to see how that uh, develops and plays out uh, going forward. On the commercial side, I think the first thing to say is that um, as the property owners and managers, uh, we absolutely recognise uh, how tough it's been for many of our tenants, particularly in the retail, leisure and uh, hospitality sectors that were really at the sharp end of uh, not only the uh, virus, but also uh, the government measures in response, so total lockdown in those sectors for, for many weeks. And certainly um, for our membership, uh, our members were very proactive in reaching out to those tenants, trying to support them, uh, wanting early discussions around rent and service charges and so on, and particularly prioritising smaller companies and independents who they knew would struggle most quickly with that dramatic loss in cash flow and operational uh, ability. Um, notwithstanding that, I think it's fair to say that the deck has felt pretty sacked against uh, landlords and property owners over the last few months, uh, thinking about the interventions that the government's made. Um, most notably, I guess, the moratoriums restricting landlords' action, firstly in relation to evictions and then in relation to the issuing of uh, winding up petitions and statutory demands, thereby effectively taking away any uh, rights of address a landlord 
I had against a tenant, whatever their circumstances in terms of non-payment of rent and property charges. Um, we've seen, I think, you know, well-capitalized companies, you know, who, including those who are now paying dividends and reporting uh, positive uh, results, uh, and some of which stayed open throughout the, the lockdown period, you know, taking advantage of those moratoriums uh, to choose not to pay their rent um, and becoming very open about saying so, regarding that as an opportunity to conserve cash and also to protect their own balance sheets at the expense um, of property owners. And we think that's unacceptable. And we launched a campaign to say that those who can pay should pay because not only do they have a legal obligation to do so, but by withholding their rental payments, which they could afford to make, they are inhibiting the ability to help other tenants in real distress and in real need. And also, of course, uh, potentially putting at risk the millions uh, of pensions of pensioners and savers who are invested in commercial property um, and the risk of investment for the future because every pound that has to be spent um, uh, managing uh, a debt liability uh, from rental service charges, a pound that can't be spent uh, to invest for the future in, in building going forward. Despite all of that, um, it still feels as if we are the ones in the position of having to uh, defend um, or at least argue the case for the moratoriums to be lifted. They're currently in place till the end of September. Uh, and it feels as if we are having to argue the case why they shouldn't be extended any further as opposed to uh, where I think the government started and what it said to us when it introduced the moratoriums, which is they were meant to be short-term measures and to help tenants uh, plan for the future and manage a short-term situation. Um, and in our view, they should be lifted as soon as possible uh, and certainly at the end of September in order that uh, the market can start to manage the situations and the debts that have arisen. Um, tenants are not being relieved of a debt obligation, they are simply deferring the payment of it. And the sooner it feels to us that, um, whatever their situation, they start to address that with their landlord, uh, we think the better and the healthier that is, because that can't, that's not a sustainable position going forward to continue to park that, that challenge and that problem. One of the ways in which we hoped that uh, those conversations would become easier and more enabled was through the government's publication of a code of practice, which we and a number of other industry bodies representing both landlords and tenants were involved in the creation of. And really the code was meant to be uh, a way of encouraging people to come to the table, to reach agreements, to have discussions around a sustainable way forward for both landlords and tenants. Um, it's early days yet. I think there are some signs uh, that for some parties it has provided a platform and enabled a conversation to start. Uh, in other cases, I think it's clear that the overriding backstop of the moratorium is preventing tenants from coming to the table. Um, and you know, I have to be even handed, you know, from looking at it from the other side, uh, I think the prospect of lifting the moratorium may be preventing some landlords from wanting to come to the table um, and have conversations with tenants. So we are hoping and advocating, and as are the other industry bodies, that people uh, do use the code to come to the table sooner rather than later to discuss and try and agree a sustainable way forward. We think in some cases that won't be possible um, because between the landlord and the tenant, they won't have the combined financial ability to deal with the historic debt uh, that has arisen over the last few months whilst lockdown has been in place, um, as well as agree a sustainable way forward. So that's why we, again, in common with a number of other industry bodies representing both landlords and tenants have put forward to government proposal for a furloughed space grant scheme, which is really a scheme that's designed on the one hand to incentivise landlords and tenants uh, to come together to recognise that each of them has to bear a part of the pain of dealing with coronavirus, but also that unless uh, the gap um, that they have in their collective finances is able to be bridged by the government, by some government uh, grant support rather than a loan, because a loan is just another unsustainable part of a debt mountain that's uh, being incurred, unless the government is prepared to step in and bridge that gap, fill the gap with a grant, um, then, then there will not be a sustainable future for the landlord and tenant working together. So we hope that the Chancellor's listening. Um, it, we're disappointed that he didn't take the opportunity in the uh, summer statement uh, last week to do something to address that challenge, um, but we continue to lobby for that uh, and make that case very strongly to government. Um, just to finish off then, I think a couple of 
final points to make. Uh, we think that uh, the government's intervention in the commercial relationship between landlords and tenants was extremely significant. We think the property sector was singled out uh, for that kind of an intervention. Um, we have recognised and had to recognise the government's argument that in exceptional times, exceptional measures were necessary. It was only ever meant as a short term measure um, and that they didn't intend to fundamentally alter the relationship or to override contracts. However, the longer that this situation goes on, um, the more danger we see that investors uh, will not be able to see through a message that this is short term and exceptional and they will uh, increasingly see and recognise in their thinking the political risk that what they thought of as a secure rental uh, stream might not be so in the future and that government interventions in the future might also take action to undermine the investment proposition uh, that they think they are making when they come to UK real estate. UK real estate is an absolute jewel in the crown uh, for the government in terms of global investment. Uh, it's historically been a very attractive place. We want that to continue to be the case. And therefore, uh, we think that the government does need to take action as soon as possible to restore uh, and reassure investors that they can continue to invest in confidence in UK real estate. And my final point, which I hope will lead to some questions, I haven't yet seen any being written, so please do start writing your questions now um, before I hand over to Sandy, um, is that you know, it's clear that some of the trends that were already happening that will impact on real estate will be accelerated, whether that's the uh, the change in uh, retail, that's the changing uh, face of the office. Uh, I've touched on some changes that might take place in residential. Um, I think that will create challenges for the sector, but also as ever opportunities as we try to respond to those changing ways, in the way that we use buildings um, and the changes in the way that uh, we might want to uh, use buildings going forward. And also, of course, we underlying all of that have the huge challenge of trying to build that better uh, and in a more environmentally friendly way. We know that real estate is a huge part of the uh, challenge of meeting uh, net zero in the UK. Um, and we have to not lose sight of that challenge in the way in which we do seek to recover, in the way in which we do plan to build for the future. And I think that's a huge opportunity and a huge challenge. And we hope that government will align with the property industry in finding a way to meet that challenge and those objectives. The final challenge that I would talk about where I not about to hand over to Sandy is the huge challenge of creating a more diverse and inclusive property industry. But she is going to talk about that. So I am not going to touch on that other than to say that, that is also a massive priority for the BPF going forward and fundamental to the future health of our industry. But with that, I'm going to hand over to Sandy. Thank you. I'm delighted to be here and also to pick up uh, the particular issues that both Stacey and Melanie have raised, which are the people issues. I'll talk primarily about gender. The organisation is called Women in Property, but we are also looking to address the whole question of diversity. And one of the pleasures of being involved in public affairs for women in property is that it covers such a wide range of professions. So in our discussions and our mentoring schemes and our uh, policy uh, delivery, we will be sitting in rooms with lawyers, solicitors, architects, town planners, contractors, civil engineers, landscape architects. And this is the way forward, I think, for the industry to deliver better. But we are in this extraordinary situation now with the effect of coronavirus and COVID-19. We don't know what the new normal will be, but I think we're getting the whole hold of the current normal. And just in, in four months, we have seen such a dramatic change to the way that people now work. On a very simplistic level, one could say that in many ways, working from home, for example, is just perfect for women working in the property sector. But we know from research and reports that this is actually a double-edged sword, that the majority of women are not only working from home, but they're also working at home, and they're taking the full brunt of this burden. So they're doing the homeschooling, they're managing their home, they're balancing their computer on their laps in the back bedroom with, with a toddler. And I think Melanie's reference to how people will want to live from now on is going to be a very important one. And this is a global impact. I think it's significant that 
the report by Forbes recently said, how is it that the countries that have responded with the least damage to COVID-19 are the countries led by women? And yet just a few months ago on March the 25th, I went to a Chatham House round table where the Reykjavik index on leadership showed that in the UK, which used to rank first with regard to attitudes towards women lead leaders, has actually dropped to fourth in the table. And the gender issue in property and construction isn't just a, a moral imperative. It's going to be a social imperative and it's also an economic imperative. Stacy referred to a lack of staff being a problem. Um, we heard, I heard yesterday that many in the construction sector are concerned about where the people are going to come from actually to generate the buildings. Apprenticeships have been stopped, so there's already a six month lag. So we're coming back now both to policy issues and management. And when it comes to policy issues, what we try to do at Women in Property is to be a voice on a bigger stage than our own stage in the property sector. As Melanie says, it, it's, the changes will be driven by policy and having round tables where people get together to talk policy and find ways to resolve things for the better are really important. I'd like to pick on four areas that are directly related to COVID-19 with some suggestions on where we think management can shift in order to look at the people issues and particularly the diversity issues because we're facing not only COVID-19 but also the whole impact of Black Lives Matter which is, in, is having an effect on our lives. For the last three years Women in Property has participated in the all-party parliamentary group for women and work and we have submitted case studies and research and reports. At the beginning, we were the only uh, property built environment participants in this, which I think is, is interesting. We, we try to get to places the other parts of the construction and property industry don't reach in order to raise that pro profile and to learn from others, but also to say and celebrate what we're doing well. Our most recent contribution was on furlough. We did some research into how firms and companies are managing their furloughed staff, many of whom are women. And we already know that um, more women than men are losing their jobs and more women than men are being furloughed. And we found quite striking differences in approach to how furlough is managed. It's a deeply worrying, upsetting time for staff, but if it's managed right, it can have very positive results. So we produced two case studies, which we've shared, which shows how one member of staff has been given the opportunity whilst on furlough, on furlough to be upskilled in a new, um, a new training, a new ability that will not only benefit her and give her a sense of purpose while she is on furlough, but will also benefit the employer. The other example was completely opposite. And I think this sends a message, which is how do you, at a time of crisis, as well as running your business, and as a, as a businesswoman, I understand you have to keep the show on the road, but how do you best manage the staff in your employ? So we have some uh, useful guidance on how to manage furlough and how to treat it in a way that enhances what you're delivering. We also discovered while doing this, that some women were finding new jobs. There's a sort of feeling in this strange new world that everything is, is slightly frozen, but some people are actually finding themselves new employment. They don't even visit the new employer. So your staff have somewhere else to go if they feel that their, their job is in aspect, aspect or there is no way forward. Yesterday, I heard somebody from the Association of British Insurers say that research shows that job share has a less negative impact on a woman's career than part-time working, which I find a fascinating piece of information. 
So here's another opportunity to look again at how to manage your staff and maybe create job share opportunities that will help keep the women you want and address that tricky moment in the mid-career of women in construction and property. The other area where we've been very busy at uh, Women in Property for many years is in mentoring. And mentoring has really come into its own at the time when people are working from home or working virtually. And this leads me to the Black Lives Matter and the diversity issues around BAME. We are now looking in our strategy at how to help companies work with reverse mentoring, particularly working with BAME uh, members of the community or members of the workforce, reverse mentoring senior people in the organisation. So you get this walking in my shoes issue, which I think is so important to make a difference. When it comes to shortages, we have to maintain outreach. We have to continue finding the right people for this industry because we need more of the right people, whatever the shape will be. Our outreach programmes with students, for example, and we have an increasing number of our student award winners from very diverse backgrounds, must continue. And it's dispiriting to learn that both the RICS and the CITB have mothballed their diversity and inclusion programmes. This should not happen. The government has also reduced the requirement for gender pay gap reporting. This isn't a time to leave these things in mothballs because there are more important things to happen. And running through it all is the unconscious bias issue. I just said I'm a businesswoman. I've run a business and sustained it through three recessions. This is, this is an extraordinary time. I can also wear a landlord hat. I have just lost my tenants because they're French and Spanish and there's so much uncertainty, they're going home. I'm a trustee of an orchestra that hasn't been able to play a live concert for four months. So is looking creatively at how to work in spaces in the right way to sustain its business. I'm also a non-executive director of a construction products company who found that their diverse approach to their services has really paid off, but it was not easy, um, but they, they managed it. There, there are ways of managing these things being creative. And we need to support and retain the women who are working in the industry. And I think there's some added value here. Again, picking up what Melanie said and also what Stacey said, we're going to be living differently. We've had interesting conversations with women architects about using copper fittings within homes because copper is an antibacterial metal, so is far better in in the case of increased uh, interest in um, uh, antibacterial in safe environments. There are women working to create the sort of homes you can live and work in, who are actively campaigning against creating windowless apartments in warehouses simply to get the numbers up. So we need to think how women can help in whatever the new normal will be and look after the women we already have in the industry and use their contribution, but it's also a way of maintaining businesses. So there are four ways of doing it. Looking at how flexible and part-time job share working can help retain and maintain the morale of staff. Looking at young people coming in, particularly from BAME backgrounds and from diverse backgrounds, and creating the progression systems and reverse mentoring that will keep them and learn from them. Keep that involvement in public debate. As I said, we're involved with the all-party parliamentary groups. We participated in Chatham House. We've contributed to uh, research projects by universities not only to represent the industry, but also to share good practice and learn from others. So we do need to sustain a more diverse industry. We need to not give up our efforts to bring new people in, but we must hold on to the ones we've got and then make the most of what they can offer because we need completely different thinking and new skills. 
I've used my five minutes, so I shall stop there, but I have a raft of research facts and figures here if anybody has a question about these uh, from everybody from Helena Morrissey through to the University of Sussex um, and Forbes and McKinsey who are producing a whole series of very interesting reports on how to manage businesses and staff at a time of COVID and coronavirus pandemic and economic change. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Sandy. Um, and can I invite Caroline and Paul to join us on screen? This is the point at which uh, you would normally say, would you like to come up on stage and join us? Well, you are now on our virtual stage. Um, and let's start off with a couple of tax questions. And thank you for the questions that are coming in. And I will come back to the ones that are uh, aimed at me a little bit later on, but let's bring in our our, ta our formidable tax team and I've got one of my own but let's start with one on the uh, chat which is uh, do you think there's a prospect of the government bringing in uh, an SDLT uh, cut for properties above £500,000? Uh, who wants to pick that one up? I, I'm happy to pick that one up. Shall I pick that one up? Um, the, 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 my quick answer would be is I don't think there's as much political will uh, to um, change the rate of SDLT beyond the f half a million pounds. Um, I think what will be interesting is this this tax holiday we've got at the moment, the SDLT holiday, obviously it has got a, an end date of end of March uh, next year. Now that's not going to help at all with the terms of building new houses. We're just looking at the existing stock and it will be interesting to see what happens to the market and how does it improve its liquidity. Um, Boris has in the past talked about reducing the overall rate of SDLT. Um, but at the same time, he's also saying he's bringing in the 2% for the non-residents non, for non -residents buying as well. So I can see a position that if that they would maybe reduce the headline rate, um, but they're still bringing in the 2%. So it may end up not being as bad news as it would have been, if that makes sense. But, um, but they, will get, they, they, will, you know, they will look at what happens in the market. So I can see they may bring down the headline rates, but actually when you add in other, other charges, I think that could apply. I do think that the, you know, the, 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 the tax holiday is probably in a bit of a surprise that it applies to everyone. So it applies to companies, it's not just individuals. Um, but at the same time, it might have been good for it to have gone further on the 3%. I don't think anybody likes the 3% rules, those additional dwellings rules. And more could have been done there and more could be done with SDLT to support different sectors is the answer so actually i think rather than looking at the rates should we be doing something about reforming sdlt and i know stacy mentioned we've got 11 rates i think we're about to have a lot more rates um it's too complicated for the tax that it is so um I would, you know more important than the rates is can we make it simpler please thank you uh, and one, one of the things i was reading this morning in one of the press cuts that i get was that actually um, it feels as if the, the SDLT announcement might be a stimulus to uh, buy to let investors, which I'm sure wasn't yeah. what the government had in mind um, and might very quickly cause them to, to rethink, you would have thought. Uh, yeah, I think that's the case. And I think you're also going to get people who will put uh, comp uh, you know, properties into companies in order that they can trigger their 3% payback. Uh, which they wouldn't have done before because it would have been a block. Um, so I think we will see more of that and we will have, yeah, the, the buy to let landlord and all the, in, do you incorporate, not incorporate? It'll be interesting to see, but I think we will have a flurry over the short term as people take advantage of that, which just leads to that cliff edge that we had when they introduced the 3%, that we had a big rise in activity just mm -hmm. before that. And then the market dropped off, um, which is not, I don't think is a good idea for the market. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, a couple more for the uh, the Crow team then. Uh, uh, do you anticipate a significant change to AIA on the 1st of January 2021 and any more changes to capital allowances? Um, I, I, that's an interesting one and, and obviously we can all gaze into crystal balls. Um, I suspect that in the shortish term, in order to try and stimulate the economy as we're coming hopefully out of this recession, uh, that there tax rates are unlikely to go up and something like AIA may indeed be extended as a boost to uh, investment, to encourage investment, new plant and machinery, etc. cetera. Um, I think looking longer term, if, if we, once we are coming out, there is obviously a very big black hole to fill for the treasury. Um, and, and, and so I wouldn't expect too much tax generosity once you get into the medium term, but, but I, I suspect that short term, it, 
it may well um, be increased, as I say, just for that little boost. I, th I think on capital answers, I would say, I think that more could be done to make us um, more environmentally friendly. They got rid of the ECAs and there is now no incentive. Um, so I'd like to think that, you know, um, as we get smarter about the houses we built and everything, actually having something along those lines would be a good strategy to have, just add in as well. One of this, perhaps this is for you, Stacey, a philosophical question. So um, following on from our discussion around STLT, uh, one of our uh, participants says, I believe that SDLT should be comprehensively reformed and simplified as it acts on, as a significant break on people moving house and thus tracks action numbers and obviously that knocks on into economic activity. What are the chances? Um, it would, it, I agree totally with what the, the participants said, obviously, and I actually think if it was reformed and simplified and reduced, Treasury would actually uh, raise more money. Uh, uh, from that tax and the economic and also then the ongoing economic activity because more and more people will be moving home. I certainly just talked about the funnel. If you've got a very low rate for the first half of a million pounds um, and a high rate after that, particularly in a million plus, it doesn't really encourage moving homes because people can't move up the ladder. Do I think there's a high, a high chance of that? I think there's a chance, uh, but I don't think it's a high chance. Um, which is a shame because it really would raise, I, I really believe it would raise a level of economic activity and raise the tax take. Um, as we try and close this huge fiscal deficit going forward, um, you know, uh, check, reducing taxes to increase your tax take and increase economic activity, which on, further increases your tax take, is the best option. Um, but the political will needs to be there as well. So even if, it, even if they can understand that it's a good idea, which it is, uh, politically it can be tricky uh, reducing high levels of SDLT for a million pound houses for obvious reasons. I think it's quite interesting because uh, from memory, it's not that long ago that SDLT rates were much more consistent both between commercial and residential uh, and in terms of not having these very high additional bands. And from memory, it was George Osborne that started introducing, in a way, some of these complications. And, and I think ever since that happened, the industry has been calling for, for, for a simplification, at least. Um, we, we've had at least a few chancellors since then um, who have had the opportunity, if they so chose, to do something. And it's not really happened in principle. Uh, I mean, obviously, we've got this uh, current 500k uh, zero band which in itself is welcomed but uh, interestingly Rishi, Rishi Shunak did not see fit to go any further with reform than that. I'll take I'll do one more tax question and then we'll move on to some people questions. Um, the, we had a review of capital gains tax announced yesterday. Uh, what do you see as the opportunities there? Um, anyone like to pick that up? Paul? Mm -hmm. Um, I, I, I mean, it's, it's interesting, um, like many other taxes, the capital gains tax system has become more complex of late and there, there's these sort of dual rates for individuals, depending on, on whether it's sort of residential property and, and other assets very broadly. Um, and in companies, it's very different because it's a flat 19%. Um, I, as I said earlier, I, th I think in the short term, we are unlikely to see significant increases in tax rates until the economy has got a bit more momentum in it. Going forward after that, it probably is, it, it is a good idea from the government's perspective to focus on, on gains tax. And, and you could argue philosophically, why should capital gains be taxed at lower rates than income? And, and you know, there are arguments both ways on that. Um, but, it, but in terms of raising some more fun, more, more revenue in the medium and longer term, I, I would have thought capital gains tax is quite likely to increase. No, I'd, 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 I'd agree with that as well. I think the other area that, that will be looked at is um, obviously we had loads of changes on the entrepreneurs relief that went down from, from the 10 million. Um, but we still have other relief such as investors relief, which is still at the 10 million amount. Um, and I think that that will be part of the review is to actually look at what, how are we incentivizing people? Are we incentivizing in the right place? 
Um, I think there will always be an entrepreneur's relief of some type. Um, but yeah, we've had various iterations of it and then that would be part of the review is looking at the reliefs and are they targeted in the right place? I think that was the last touch question. I'm going to sneak in one more in before I come to, to Sandy and we talk about people. Um, what are your views on the likelihood of a new tax based on property values being brought in over the medium term to increase the fees? Uh, well, I mean, who knows, you know, the, the possibility of, of some sort of wealth based tax, some um, tax based on annual tax based on value of property has been mooted for a long time. From memory, the Lib Dems were in favour of yeah. this a few elections ago. Um, not coming yet. Um, I suspect it would be deeply unpopular with core Conservative voters, which, which may put the current government off doing anything too much that way. Um, and in part, as I suppose it depends how desperate they become to raise the revenue, um, you know, to fill the hole that's been created during the COVID crisis. I, I, we, we, we sort of, we had obviously George Osborne introduced the ATED and that was the first that sort of was linked to values and was an annual tax on property values. Um, I, I, I can see that rather than, I think wealth tax is quite a difficult tax to do because you've got to value everybody's invest, you know, investments on an annual basis. Um, and I think that would be a very difficult compliance to bring in personally, um, ask everybody to revalue. Um, what I think would be more like I can see would be, we've had it in the past is higher rates of corporate tax for different types of companies. So you could have property investment companies having a higher rate of corporate tax. That's probably an easier one to implement and to manage going forward. I mean, I totally agree, and particularly if they increase the personal capital gains tax rate on properties, the obvious initial thought is, right, I'll put it into a company. So, you know, unless they address that at the same time, it's going to distort behaviour. Mm. Uh, right. Could, could I, so, yes, Melanie, I'd like to sort of just put in a very quick question while we're on tax, which is, uh, in, in the past, whenever we've talked about construction, uh, VAT has always been something of a hot topic and the mismatch between new build and refurbish and the complications around that. But VAT hasn't come into the discussion at all this morning. Is that because there's still so much confusion or is the focus very much on major um, corporate tax and, and wealth tax, which is the focus? Have you any views on whether there might be any changes on VAT, which would help the small end of the construction and development industry? Certainly in terms of sort of speculation and talk on, on potential future tax changes, they have, as you said, focused on corporation tax and, and personal taxes. Um, I've not heard mooted any sort of real suggestions about fundamental changes to the VAT system as it, as it applies to construction. Um, but I suspect in a few years they will be scratching their heads to think, how on earth can we raise more money and, and everything will be up for grabs. Right. So it's it's waiting in the wings, you think? <laughs> I think, yes. <laughs> It'll get easier. Well, they can make, obviously make more changes when we leave on the Brexit. But mm. uh, yes, it won't be so governed by EU law. Mm. But, yeah. Right, let's move on and talk about how we all behave and uh, the places that we want uh, to live and work and relax in. Um, Sandy, uh, we create places that in many cases formulate designed by middle class white men for middle class white men with no thought to cultural, ethnic, physical or neurodiversity. How can we break this vicious cycle to ensure that we create diverse places for and designed by a more diverse pool of talent. So it's partly about how we've got the people who can imagine the kind of places that are diverse and how we how we create those places. I think it is, it's who's driving the, the economic um, reality of the construction. I think there have been in the past some very interesting um, housing schemes and plans that have had multidisciplinary people in place that have made a difference. I, there has to be more sitting around the table, I think, as you've said yourself. But on, on the I actually, to be quite honest, let's cut to the chase. I don't know why we don't do it better, really. It seems blindingly obvious that you build a house or a property or somewhere to live that is, is worth living in. Is the mismatch, is it the old sore about 
uh, an architect living in a Queen, Han, Queen Anne mansion somewhere in the home counties, designing uh, multi-occupancy buildings in a, in a city. I'm sure it can't be that simplistic. But when you consider how many architectural practices there are, how many um, uh, local authorities, oh, there we're getting to the point, aren't we? Who is providing the homes? Let's go to the supply chain. Who is providing and creating the homes for people to live in? That must be the starting point. And who does it better? Has, has anybody out there, and we've got a big audience here, who, who out there feels that there are countries that provide the right homes for their people and how do they do it? There's the question, because I don't know why we can't do it better. Any, any answers out there? Let's watch the, the chat. Uh, have you got a view, Melanie? I mean, it's, it seems, is it simply money or is it will? But it, it's not rocket science to create decent homes. So is it money or is it politics? Um, I'm not sure I do have a, a view really. I think I think I think so. The question was broader and not just about homes, but around communities. I think, mm. um, and I think we do stand rightly accused in that broader context of you know, not having within our workforce um, people whose experiences and lives and circumstances really give them an insight into some of the communities that they design for other people to live in. I mean, I think, you know, that is a, I think that is something we need to hold a mirror up to ourselves as an industry um, and be thoughtful about. And I think there are lots of forwardly, you know, thinking companies trying to change that and turn that around in different ways, whether that's through better consultation mechanisms um, and, you know, real engagement with local communities before they finalise their plans as opposed to sort of telling people what they're going to provide for them um, and sort of having their homework marked as it were, I, you know, whether it's that or whether it's, you know, really being brave and imaginative about making their workforces more diverse, whether it's about accepting that actually that we're a very insular industry and that actually if you bring in the types of skills from other industries that are much more used to thinking about customers and about putting people at the heart of how they Think about and approach problems and I think there are lots of different ways in which the industry is trying to to rise to this challenge but I think we've got a long way to go as yet um, and as ever we're judged I think by our poorest and weakest performances and bad examples rather than the exemplars which we can all point to where you can really see companies rising to this challenge and being really imaginative and really creative about how they respond so I, I think, think it's a, yeah. It's the journey in that hackneyed phrase, but I think it is a journey. There are examples where people have bothered to ask and inquire that have made a change that's really quite simple. Um, I'm reminded of an example where um, a lift company had to go into a multi-occupancy building and re replace all the lifts. So for a period of time, the residents needed to use the stairs. So they created on the landings a meeting place because the people needed to sit and rest. And they put chairs and on one of the next visits, the lift company found that there was a coffee machine. And it turned out that because people were walking up the stairs and sitting and taking a breather, the people living on that particular floor started creating meeting points and coffee mornings. So that's why the coffee machines arrived. When the lifts were finally completed, the residents said, will you please leave these areas on the landings because we now know who else lives here. And that came from a meeting with residents about how to make this disruption to their lives more bearable. A very simple example, but that's, that's the sort of thing that I think makes a difference where you have the consultation and what is it you need here? I think we're going to face a huge challenge on how we provide enough housing with outside space after the effect specifically of COVID-19. I think the people who have been cooped up on the 15th floor of a block of flats 
whether or not they're trying to work from home, but with, with young children, with no outside space, is frankly horrendous. So I think there has to be a drive. How much of it is carrot and how much is stick, I don't know. I know many people in the industry who would love to build the right homes for right people, but then there are barriers. They might be policy barriers, there'll be cost barriers. So it has to be partly stick which is that every space from now on must have that access to light and air, even if it's just a balcony. Clearly, if you have a more diverse team in the planning, you have a different view. And I think you have different life experiences. There have been some very interesting examples of um, disabled people or people with impaired mobility being called in to advise and the creation of homes that are envelopes so that you have um, people with more mobility, living with people with reduced mobility and the way the building is constructed to help both. So there are plenty of examples, Melanie, as you say. It's how you scale it up that I think is the big question. And there's no doubt that if you have people who have the life experiences who contribute to that design rather than the creative buzz, then that will make a difference. We have to have more diverse teams, but the diverse teams also have to have clout. You can have all the mixed teams in the world in your business, but if they don't actually have an audible voice at the table, nothing's going to change. So there is a visibility and an audibility issue to drive forward the changes we need. And we need to be more creative. And I think you're, I mean, you touched on cost. I mean, I think because we've got such a, supply demand mismatch in the homes for sale market in particular I mean I think that does drive cost to be a more important factor than it ought to be if you were trying to take a rounded view you know of, of what people should be entitled to expect I guess which as you say might change I mean I think you know coming back to the build to rent um, sector I mean there is an opportunity there I think because um, the investors uh, in Build to Rent can think very long term and do, I think, start from a customer service point of view. And they have a brand and a reputation uh, associated with providing the service of a, a decent home that meets people's expectations and needs built into the into the model. Um, so I think you know that maybe that that Build to Rent, you know, as in as in other ways, can be a trailblazer for this kind of thinking. It'll be really interesting to see how how the sector reacts. Um, to some of those changes in expectation, um, I think it'd be really interesting to see. I'm going to move on to another couple of uh, questions. So, does the panel feel that once lockdown ends for good, employees might return to the office more regularly in order to reconnect socially with work colleagues? So, how do we feel? Working at home, not working at home? What do we feel about that? Sandy, do you want to start? I, I think people need the buzz of an office. Um, many, many years ago when Charles Handy said the future of work is going to be remote, you know, I thought then that there is, there is a limit to working in isolation. I think it's really important for younger people to have the buzz of the workplace because it's actually being in an office with peers or being on site with their colleagues and peers, which is part of the learning process. And it's also part of the enjoyment of working. So I think there will be I think there will be a mixture. I think a lot of people will love to see the back of commuting, but I think that it's, it's not one or the other. I think, I think there has to be some flexibility around how much time you can work away from the office, and, but also recognizing the importance of being in the office. I think following COVID, there are going to be issues around things like hot desking, and I'm not quite sure how that's going to work, um, with the new requirements. But I think there needs to be found a way of that. Um, and it's all very well having team meetings and Googling each other. But I think actually being with a group of people working is really important. So I think the challenge is going to be, well, it's not a challenge. I think the, what needs to be done is a very clear working out of the structure. It's taking flexible working beyond. Um, at Women in Property we ran a, a, a seminar on top 10 tips on agile working and the difference between agile working and flexible working. And I think what we're seeing now is a need to take that discussion even further because what we're talking about here is a mixture of agile and flexible. 
and, and and I find if I'm there's a difference between sitting in peace and quiet and being really creative and very productive and then having that running down feeling that you need something else to kickstart you to get you to perform again at full tilt and I think that's going to be the interesting to thing to, to find is to work out how to provide both and if we can get that right, Stacey, that's are you in the office, Stacey? Yeah, I, I am. <laughs> are you alone? Or are there other people there? Than, 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 than in my home, but there's, there's virtually no one here, of course, as you would expect. I agree with uh, what Sandy said. Um, there's certain advantages in terms of the office, enjoyment, creativity, loyalty to the organisation, motivation, teamwork. Um, I think what we're seeing, what the surveys tend to suggest, is we clearly moved a long way with them, um, uh, there, there'll be some positives and the flexibility in the agile working. Um, but we'll see people operating, I think, on average on a 50-50 basis. Um, um, and that's what our service is seeing. Obviously, there'll be some people more than that and will be in the office more, and there are some people less than that. Uh, but there's certainly, we're, we're seeing certainly in the last month or so, individuals wanting to, ha to, to have a change of environment, difficulty of working at home continuously, every single day um, and missing that interaction. Um, the issue we'll have for the next few months certainly will be that of course coming to the office you're not getting that interaction understandably uh, because of the safety requirements in terms of numbers and in terms of how we have to operate within the office. Uh, but I certainly think uh, uh, if we're looking at the more medium and long term we'll see a much more flexible agile 50-50 approach where people can work at home if they want to and work in the office if they want to and there will be benefits in both but uh, certainly a change. Thank you. Well we're coming to the end of our time so I'm just going to mop up a couple of questions um, that were asked at the start of the uh, uh, webinar about the uh, my comments on the moratorium. Um, why do I think we seem to be having to do the running around the moratorium and what's going to happen with the rent arrears um, I, I think in a nutshell, the answer to the, the, the combined answer to those two questions is I don't think the government, when it took the initial measures it took uh, in March, thought that this situation would last as long or be as serious as it's turned out to be. I suspect they thought they were genuinely taking what would be a short term measure um, in place for a few weeks and that, you know, things would get back to normal much more quickly. Um, Having sort of started off with that mindset um, and having to change tack, I think they found themselves in a situation where it's really difficult to uh, manage the consequences of what they did at the time. So I think it's right that um, it will be politically quite difficult to get out of um, the, the moratoriums and that it's just created a problem which has become a much bigger problem um, and a longer lasting problem than they thought it would. Um, but I think, you know, equally, they can't uh, sustain it indefinitely. Um, and I think they know that too. So what I think we have to do is work as hard as we can across all, um, all of the property owning uh, part of, of the industries, but also the tenant bodies. I think we have, to, we have to find shared solutions to this. And that will partly be about everybody having to take some pain, as indeed uh, property owners already are. Um, but I think, and I come back to the grant scheme, I think that also means the government is going to have to step in and make that an easier transition. Um, because I just think you know, that it's created a, a bigger problem than the system can cope with in some places. And the link question was around um, the attitude of lenders. I um, mean, my, my view is lenders so far haven't been significantly tested, but the, the longer this situation goes on, the more tested they will be. Um, obviously, there were fairly early on some fairly, uh, some fairly clear advice coming out from the regulators uh, to the uh, regulated lending sector, um, but a large part of the property industry is supported by unregulated lending. So I think the challenge will be to manage um, a consistent approach as far as possible, looking at this from a customer point of view, across the lending sector that recognises the position that borrowers are in and tries to support them as those companies have tried to support their customers, um, to bring as many people as possible through unscathed. But we know there are also going to be casualties. We're already seeing that and we're expecting to see more over the next few months because sadly not every business will be able to sustain 
the impact of coronavirus. I think the government's done quite a remarkable job actually trying to support you know, as many individuals and as many businesses as possible. Um, but at some point, you know, those, the pain will come home to roost for some, for some businesses as it is doing for some individuals. Um, and I think, you know, in a sense, the more we can manage that and come to that point and move through it, the more we can, the more quickly we can start to rebuild. And my view is that, you know, postponing a problem indefinitely is not really a sensible or sustainable answer to, to managing the problem. Um, we have at some point to face up to the implications, to deal with them and to move on. Um, but I think it's a, it's a courageous government that decides when that moment is. So thank you to everyone for all of your questions and comments. I hope you found that useful. Stacey, I'm going to hand back to you just uh, for a final, final wrap up before we let everyone go. Thank you, Melanie. Um, again, uh, just to reiterate, thank you to, uh, uh, to the team at Crow uh, and to the team at BPF, particularly Melanie, and the team at Women in, Women in Property, Fiona and Sandy, for helping us put this together or for really putting it together. We're using the BPS platform. Thank you so much to you for joining us um, and for contributing and answering, uh, uh, asking so many questions. Um, and thank you very much to Melanie again for, for facilitating so well. So we hope to be able to see everybody soon. Maybe we will be able to run this in a more face-to-face -face way. Um, obviously, unfortunately, if we can't, we'll try and do something, uh, something similar. So we look forward to any comments. Um, please feel free to leave on the chat box or in a box if you've got any comments of other topics that you would like, like us to speak about um, and if you found it useful or not. So again, thank you so much for joining us. And um, I'm going to press the do the difficult job of pressing the leave button. So thank you.